Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us again. Uh, hopefully everyone arrived safely from previous session. If you can hear me and see us, please uh, make sure you say hi. Uh, we are absolutely delighted to have uh, here with us today Lisa Clark. Uh, Lisa had absolutely fantastic talk at the Earl Conference and she kindly agreed to speak at our conference this year. Um, so as you can guess from the logo, Lisa is working for Virgin Media and she's leading data science team. And she uh, she's actually a strate strategic data scientist, which is quite interesting. And she has more than 20 years of experience. Uh, so I'm sure we all um, we all can learn something from Lisa. So without any more interest, uh, Lisa, over to you now. Yeah, good morning. And thank you so much for the invitation to, to come and speak. It's um, a real honor. And I'm hoping that it's a bit of a different talk. So I'm hoping that you all get something slightly quirky and, and good out from it that you can you can learn from. So um, what I'd like to talk about is the tension really between uh, doing something for fun and doing something for essentially money for, for capital gain um, and how you can work a team of, of developers predominantly in R, we actually use R and Python, but how you can use R to actually really um, get a good value from your, from your team. So why is this not clicking on? Let me just check. Let me do it that way then. There we go. So most people assume that actually having fun and getting value from some, almost anything, but um, especially when you're talking about coding and developers, is actually the same as sort of um, pitting the programmers against a business or, in your case, say, a, a public service. Um, and actually, it's that, that kind of tension and, and, and um, pull between really enjoying something, spending time on it, but actually being able to deliver something with real value. And actually, what I want to show in this talk is that's a real misnomer. And um, it doesn't have to be the case. And I understand why business people think that's the case. But actually, I'm going to try and use my personal experience and some examples um, to show you that actually it can be both fun and valuable. And what I really want you to take away from this is that no matter where you are in kind of like the scheme hierarchy, that hopefully you can use some of my learnings um, to influence in your own space, whether that's downwards to your own teams, whether it's sideways to your peers, or even upwards to senior leaders, to try and to try and use this to um, get the best out of your own development or your team's development. So, before I um, sort of go straight into the complexities, I think it's it's worth putting a, a bit of perspective on this, um, a little bit about me. Um, it's really nice that I'm following Rob because I'm also based in Sheffield. I was a postdoc at the University of Sheffield and ended up managing a few research projects there, but ended up um, leaving and realizing that actually my core skills are, and the things that I really love, are anything to do with data programming. And I've got, I should put computing in there as well. So anything to do with computers, analysis. And then there's the business part on there that's actually how do you solve a business problem? So that's what led me into data science, and I lead the team at um, Virgin Media. But it's also worth saying um, there aren't that many female data scientists, at kind of certainly at my level, but we are around. It is not um, unusual. But also, I emphasize to everyone that um, don't fall into that kind of stereotype. I am um, very sporty. I play hockey, but I also have a family. So I think it's really worth worthwhile saying that. Um, I'm not going to go too much into Virgin Media. I hope you um, mostly have um, seen Virgin Media at some part um, through branding and, and publicity. But what I will just say is that we do have a B2B side, um, which I've worked in for two years. I moved over recently to take on the whole of Virgin Media. But we have Virgin Media business. Most people aren't aware of it. And actually, we serve um, the large majority of uh, blue light companies. So obviously the NHS is one of them, all the NHS trusts, hospitals, but we also do schools, um, councils, etc. So um, it's quite relevant that I'm, I'm here talking to you because um, Virgin Media is really embedded into the NHS. So what I've said um, already is that I want to lend a little bit of my experience of having led analytical teams for a, a very long, long time. Um, fundamentally, I think it seems to boil down to several things. So on, on the business side, um, senior leaders always demand a return on investment. And Rob alluded to this where he said time is money and spending that time up front is, is costly, but actually pays back. 
but the, the business kind of demands that value and they don't always see because they want the quick solutions they don't always see that kind of tension between actually give me time now and you'll you'll get the time back later especially if you're automating something and it is really valuable um and the business can often sort of see a skilled analyst as, as an expensive resource so naturally they want those quick solutions because they don't want to waste valuable resource on something when it could be sort of more of an admin job that's maybe cheaper and certainly in, in my line of work um the business doesn't necessarily understand uh ai and i include machine learning in here in sort of the, the more complex aspects of data science on the other hand you've got the data scientists who want to develop really exciting code they've gone into this because of like me they're passionate about sort of the the problem solving and the computing and the algorithmic part and they want to learn new tricks and they want to keep up with the trends and things like data science move up move on really quickly r as a programming language always has new packages new techniques new algorithms being coded um, and, and typically programmers want to keep up with those trends hence there's an, an, an NHSR conference right they hate too much data engineering um, everyone hates data engineering unless you're a data engineer and, and uh, have gone into that specifically but certainly data scientists hate it and typically data science projects aren't quick and that goes for you know anything to do with coding and if you're going to do something really well and do it um, effectively actually these things aren't usually quick and managers are usually stuck in the middle. They're trying to find the right projects with the right priorities. What do you favor? Do you favor automating something but spending the time up front to get the value later? Do you do just the, the quick bit of work that's maybe a bit dirty? And obviously they're stuck between delivering that high value to the business on the one hand, and then on the other hand, actually trying to engage the team, especially if they're developers, they're introverts, et cetera, and, and you want to keep them um, learning and, and have that um, motivation and so it can actually be really um, quite a complex struggle in the middle let's put this in a different way um, this is i guess a little stereotypical but it's pretty much true that what makes a programmer happy is actually a few things if you boil them down is essentially a computer naturally of their choice which isn't always optional i have a windows machine i prefer to work on Mac or Linux, so I've ended up getting a, a, a server that's uh, Linux. Um, High-speed internet, I include network and connectivity here, and it could be connection to, could be the cloud to do, um, for, say, infrastructure there. It could be um, just simple Wi-Fi access, but it could actually, it could be networks to databases, for example. A good problem to solve, absolutely essential, something to get the uh, mental juices flowing. And then the critical part here is an empty room, the space to actually think about the problem, dissect it, to learn more about it, learn techniques that might work, and then actually start coding and implementing a solution. And typically, programmers are introverts. I say typically, not, not all. Um, and that empty room, that space and, and um, ability to think is really critical. So what tricks have I learned to get my team engaged? Um, I will be incredibly honest, it's a little bit like a chemistry experiment. This is things that I have done the hard way. Some things have gone really well, and I um, have used those again and again, and some things have gone horribly badly, in which case I'm very transparent with my teams and say, you know what, I got that wrong, let's not do that again. Um, and it's about that transparency in working with a team and allowing yourself to get it wrong and say, oops, sorry. But the things that I have, have, have found essentially boil down to one thing or three things to give especially my team a data science team but this goes to um, programming and um, analytical teams you need to give them space and time with the right tools and that's those three things are easy to say and actually quite hard to put in practice so for me as a manager it's about using the correct tools it's making sure we've got our studio set up in a really good way on the right server so that it, 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 it functions correctly and is accessibly or is accessible and easily accessible. Removing IT barriers wherever possible so that actually programmers can just log in and code without having excess um, worries. Always fewer meetings. Um, this comes up again and again. Um, it's about finding the right space. If programmers have little bitty meetings throughout a day actually it 
it really eats into a chunk of coding time where you can just really absorb yourself into a problem and then find the solution. So we've had things like um, blocking out certain times where the whole team just has a time that is about uh, coding or learning, et cetera. So that actually we're saying we've blocked out a full time where there won't be meetings. Um, and that's really important. And of course, just trying to say, is, is that meeting really important? Do you need to be in it? We've designed the environment to feel a little bit more academic. I have an academic background, so I, I guess that's my nature. But actually, it's my learning that if you allow people to uh, try different things, so it's trial and error, get things wrong and say, OK, it didn't work, um, and allow people to see that in the team where you learn the um, strengths and weaknesses across the team, people are more willing to accept they're wrong, accept they don't know something, and then actually come up with better solutions in that brainstorming and be much more kind of honest and transparent and engaging with a, a, a team. So that's what I mean by that sort of more academic feel. I initiated lunch and learn sessions to in, encourage that. So we have sessions where the it's peer, peer sessions. So the our team will teach each other. So they will go away and learn a trick for a project. And then they will bring that algorithm or model or code to a, a lunch and learn session. And we literally sit there maybe um, nibbling our lunch, but actually talking and learning something very new and sharing all that. Um, obviously, we're in a, an odd stage. 2020 has been a bit weird. Um, we are all remotely working at Virgin Media um, at all possible, and that's possible in a telecoms industry. So I've initiated game sessions. We actually have board games and we play sort of computer games. Anything we can do remotely, we can, uh, we, we basically just get together and, and do something that's not work and we have fun doing it. And I'm gonna emphasize we do it during work hours. We, um, I'm actually a parent. Uh, we have lots of parents, we have carers. Um, we have young people who have a really uh, sort of more active social life than myself. We have uh, sports people who like to go for runs. So I encourage these things during work hours, which is team engagement and saying, actually, this is part of work. This isn't about Friday night. Oops, you're looking after kids so you can't come. So um, I try and engage my team in those ways as well. Um, for me, um, I think managers need to know all your individual personalities. I have uh, got to know my team. That, that sounds easy, but actually it's, it's easy to forget spending time on a one to one is really critical to know the strengths and the weaknesses, but actually it's about knowing their personality traits, understanding where their irritation factors are. What do I do that will irritate some of my team? So for me personally, I've learned to listen more. I'm a huge extrovert. Uh, and in a team of introverts, that can be really difficult. So I have to learn to stop talking to the point where I feel really awkward and embarrassed because I think there's a deadly silence. And then suddenly my team might talk to me. So it's about learning yourself and your uh, your own kind of weaknesses in the sense of what other people might see as irritate, irritating, but also wonder what other people would, would see as irritating and learning how that interacts as, pe as, as people. Um, and then capability building, providing the learning and development opportunities and providing that space for the team to do it proactively and in advance of a project not waiting for a project to come up and say, right, we need to learn this algorithm, allowing my team to go out proactively, thinking that actually I don't know something, this might come up in six months, I'm going to learn it now. And then when a project does come up, you have the team ready to, to react quite quickly. And that is time because time is, is, is hard because time is money, right? So I, I do understand that. Um, I can't talk about value um, without actually defining it and going into a bit more detail, though I don't want to get stuck on this because um, certainly uh, if you're anything like um, kind of my environment at Virgin Media, value is a huge topic a, a lot of the time. And I'm, I'm pretty certain in the NHS that is, is, is very um, uh, true. But value is in the eye, eye of the beholder. Talk to five different people and you will get five different views of what they think is value and what is valuable from a project or a, um, a model. You could talk about the quality, actually whether it improves um, something, particularly say in data, uh, whether sales revenue goes up. It could be advocacy, whether your brand has improved. Um, 
or it could just be cost efficiency, actually reducing your costs. And a project could hit all of those, or it could have its own. The things I want to flag here is sometimes business leaders define value in an, uh, a non-measurable way, in which case make sure you have a metric that you can judge that value. But also, how do you potentially judge the value or, or build in value around the less or the more abstract, the less tangible aspects of a project? So capability building. It might be a lower priority project, but if, you, if it's training your team into something they didn't know before, it could be used on a more valuable project later. Um, business as usual, don't underestimate it. Um, there are so many things in Virgin Media we do that has to just run because it keeps the, the cogs turning. That is still valuable, that there is an inherent value to that. And actually um, reminding the senior leaders that actually the business as usual is, is still valuable and trying to put some metric around that, whatever that looks like. And of course, computing efficiency in a programming world where if it takes half an hour for your staff every morning to log in because you've got really complex um, VPNs because we're all ro working remotely, that is time lost that actually really can irritate most people but will really frustrate programmers and coders. So things like computing efficiency, I spend a lot of my time trying to um, get back the time for my team. So there is a tension between code and ROI, um, and I'm not going to spend too long on this slide, um, but you can obviously come back to it. But essentially, these two pieces of code in R do the same thing, right? It's a, a fizz buzz um, game. On the left hand side, uh, you have a really quick solution. And possibly you could argue it's a little bit dirty. It's, it's kind of convoluted, maybe harder to read and get through. Whereas the code on the right is it uses a function. It might be a little bit more um, uh, easy to read. Actually, they both do the same job, right? The only difference is when you'd use it. If you want to get something out really quickly and it's a one-off, you know what? The left-hand code does the job. It's absolutely adequate. Et voila, um, it, it works. If you need something that is, um, say, collaborative, you want others to understand it, or it's scalable, you want to reuse functionality, then I would say you definitely want to go to the right-hand side. So thinking about the, what you want and whether you're starting to move to say an automated collaborative shared functionality, then you need to think about your code. But you know what? Sometimes dirty code is good enough. So how to make, to, to obtain value and make it very fun. You need to incorporate everything. So you need the right projects. So make sure upfront that you know what value you're aiming for and have the right metrics that you can go for um, and the right priorities. You need the capability build, the learning development, but you also need that environmental setup. Make sure the computing is there. Make sure your hygiene factors for your staff are there and do it every day. Um, I know I'm running tight on time. Um, and I don't want to, to run over because uh, the organizers are, are going to shoot me, obviously. Um, but I want to go into just a few little ways that we use R um, in the business um, really proactively and to good value. So the knapsack algorithm, this is a project where we had, um, it was essentially capital expenditure. We only have so much money we can spend on uh, business installations, essentially. Um, so think of this um, when you're installation, installing services, Virgin Media services to a business, they're much higher cost. They can be any for, anywhere between kind of 100, um, 10,000 pounds, they can be all also up to a million pounds, depending on the solution we're putting in for our big customers. So we only have a certain amount of expenditure and every project has a value back to us in terms of revenue. Um, so essentially, we can't do all projects. We can't install everyone because we, we, we just can't do it. So where do we prioritize our CapEx budget and how can we set a threshold and what would that threshold look like? Now, we turn this on its head and I will go into the knapsack problem a bit, bit more in a minute, but we essentially um, changed it. So the original model or the original demand on us was where would you set a threshold to define which projects you um, undertake green versus the projects you don't undertake, which are in red? And the idea is here that you've, you've got um, the cost along the bottom and then the payback along the uh, y-axis. And the idea is anything um, above that diagonal dotted line is 
essentially profitable. So it's not quite that, but it's essentially that. So you want everything above the line um, it is great. If you set a really simple threshold and say any projects over £10,000, I'm just not going to do because they're, they're too expensive. You can see that actually, um, I'm not going to go into this graph too much because of time, but essentially what you get is the trade-off between um, uh, the cumulative of uh, profit means you plateau at some point. So doing higher level projects is just more cost, no real gain. And that's the point at which you can define the plateau. But if you define it there, then some profitable projects are excluded and some really loss making projects are still allowed. So you sit there and think, well, OK, you can do it. It's it's OK. But actually, is that the best way to do it? Instead, you can use something called the knapsack model, which is um, imagine you have a backpack. It's, it's an American is a knapsack, but you have a backpack. You have certain items that you want to pack. Each one has a size and a value, but you can only fit a certain amount of them into the backpack because you can't fit everything in. So what combination of those objects will maximize the value that you can take in your backpack? And that's really implemented. There are off the shelf codes that you can go and, and take. And it's essentially a few lines um, if, as long as you get your code in the right form. But essentially, it's really, really simple one line of code that given a set of projects with known costs, you can maximize the revenue, the profit for a given size of rucksack, your cap, cap, capex budget. OK, so you can run that through the code. And now what you find is actually you don't have a set threshold. Your red and green dots are pretty much um, mixed over each other. Um, and what we found was we could actually increase the profit um, by keeping within our capex, by not just setting a simple threshold, by actually allowing this to be much more flexible, we could we could actually increase the profit and stay within the capex, or we could increase the capex and make even more money. So actually, we could start to play with what what this meant in a, a range of factors, and that was really really powerful. Um, and proved that we could every month get incremental gains, um, which was really beneficial. Um, so uh, another example, and I, I'm looking at time, so I will go through it without too much detail, but essentially customer segmentation. We wanted to segment or group our customers for similarities rather than using a holistic or rather than using a human approach. So trying to look at it holistically and saying, rather than looking at profiles of customers and thinking of it like the humans, how many, how many employees does this business have? Um, where, what is their demographic? Where are they in the country? Actually saying to the, to the computer, here, have everything we know about the customer. You tell us which customers are similar. Okay. Um, and then trying to understand the customers and their wants and needs, not what we think we know about the customers or what we feel as a human. And essentially, this is just a clustering problem. And um, this is obviously in um, n-dimensional space. So we've done a, a TSNE on it. But what we did was we run a Clara model. We actually made our own bespoke model. But it's, it's in a simplistic way. It's a few lines of code to actually use huge amounts of features and then say, OK, which do the computer think are similar groups of clusters? And then what you can do is look um, between or within clusters to say, OK, these customers are within a cluster. What makes them similar? But where are their differences? Can we look at why there are differences and maybe for Virgin Media upsell different services, for example, offer them something else? We think that they look like this group, you know, the winner in the cluster. Can we offer them something else? And also the comparison between clusters is can we, um, you know, why are two two groups potentially close? but not the same. What makes them subtly different and, and should they be? Can we offer something there as well? And again, that's just a couple of lines of code. And we put that into our marketing campaigns and that's hugely um, high revenue um, on some of those. So for example, one of our models is, is, has a gain of about 50,000 pounds a month on, on some of this work. So hugely valuable from spending time understanding customers. I'm not going to spend any time on visualization because I think you've you've heard a lot about Shiny um, really effectively. But we do use Shiny. We present a message very quickly. You can see here um, two graphs that show um, our the left hand one is our duct where we're um, installed and where the duct is live. And then you can start to see 
on the right hand, the customers um, that could be serviceable and the customers who aren't, and then trying to understand very quickly where there are gaps and where there are patterns. So the visual aspect is very, very powerful. Equally, the only thing I want to say on this slide is adding value doesn't have to be complex. Sometimes it is as simple as making a good dashboard or presenting really good graphs. And R is brilliant for that. And I do really feel that people should get into that and use it a bit better um, because it, it, it's such a powerful tool. You do have to, to code it. You have to work from, from ground up. But what you get back is fabulous. And business leaders love to see the um, visualization that, that comes from the, sort of the dashboards, etc. So it's really powerful and it doesn't have to be complex. So I'm going to end um, by just kind of reminding you my, my main point is really the, the real asset when you're looking at R. R is essentially free or you can use R Studio and get some of the extra added tools. But the real asset are the programmers. They're the teams that you, you have that do the coding. So make sure that for that team, whether they're a data science team like mine, or whether they're an analytics team or just a set of programmers, actually give them the space and the time with the right tools and do it minute by minute, day to day, and make sure that they get that for their working environment, because it's very easy to forget that actually they are the asset. Give them the space to think and they will reward you hugely in value. So thanks. What a wonderful ending to the presentation, because I, I totally agree as an analyst and lots of people here today that speaks to certainly me and I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of lots of people. Thank you for that. Um, some of what you said, actually quite a lot of what you said echoes for the public sector as much as industry. So it's really lovely to hear that message as well, that we all struggle with the same problems. And I haven't. Oh, questions are coming in. OK. How big is your team? Ah, yes. Yeah. So um, I've just, uh, we've merged two teams. So uh, we've merged the Virgin Media business team with the Virgin Media consumer team. Um, so at the moment, my team is 11, including me. Um, yeah, so a reasonable size team and all data scientists. So we have separate analytics. So we have um, a data and analytics team of about 120, I believe, of which the data science team are 11. Right. Lots of discussion as well, just to point out on the activities you were you, you've been successful with or you've tried out as well to get people engaged. There's a bit of active, quite a lot of discussion. I think that's something that we're all struggling with. So thank you for sharing some of those ideas. Um, another question that's not really about relationships, though, is do you ever feel tempted to work for the NHS with the NHS data sets? I have to say the data here is everyone. fabulous. <laughs> yes. Yes. So um, one of the issues actually we had in Virgin Media Business is actually not you don't always get the volume and quality of data that you would expect. We are not a Google or a Facebook, whereas obviously in the consumer world, we get much more volume and velocity of data. So it's, it's much better for, say, data science. Um, and yeah, so in that aspect, having larger data sets that is, is really good to mine is always exciting. Um, so, it's yeah, have I done it? No. <laughs> Would I? Potentially, yes. <laughs> Good. Uh, we have another question, which is, what do you feel you brought in terms of the skills from your previous career in cosmology to your current career? I, I can guess, but so, please answer. Yeah, interestingly, um, a lot of the maths, maths, physics and statistics and the problem solving is the kind of the core skills that I would say. They're the bits I love, but they're the bits I bring. Um, but actually, from my long history, I mean, I was lucky to be a research manager. So I was able in sort of the academic environment to get it wrong in a slightly more forgiving environment because people are more willing to stand up and just say that didn't work. Um, so that kind of trial and error was useful. But also conference speaking. I, I passionately love giving talks and I, I hope it comes across. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's something I definitely learned from academia, the seminars, the willingness to engage and learn something new. And that's something I really try to bring every day into my team because I want them to know that it's OK to get things wrong because that means you'll get it right. And the brainstorming and the working to together, the collaboration and and that kind of cohesion and just getting out and about and doing things. Um, I think that's probably what I learned from my, my academic work. Obviously, I miss the cosmology itself. 
um, and all <laughs> yes. the computing and the physics. You know, I bring all that, all that kind of knowledge of the maths and the problem solving. Yes, I bring that in. I just don't get to do it on cosmology, which is sad, but I love well, my job. Well, you might be able to do it on NHS data one day, maybe. It's, yeah, it's not yeah, quite, it's, it's a bit nebulous. It's got that issue. Anyway, thank you ever so much. We could talk about this for a lot longer, I am sure, but we're going to the next one. So I hope you could join us in the next session. But thank you for taking the time okay. to come and speak to us. And no uh, soon and see everybody in the next session. And I hope everyone enjoys the conference. Bye.